Okay, welcome to the Technology Tuesday webinar series. The topic of today's uh, webinar is economic and technical analysis of emerging post-consumer plastic recycling methods. The speaker will be Matthew Franchetti of the University of Toledo. My name is Jack Himes. I'm a program manager at the Pennsylvania Recycling Market Center. The Recycling Market Center, or, or RMC, was established in 2004 as a nonprofit organization. We have five full-time employees located at Penn State Harrisburg and a satellite office in Pittsburgh. We are governed by a nine-member board of directors with four ex officio members. Here are the employees, the full-time employees of the Recycling Market Center. We also typically employ a student worker on a part-time basis. The Technology Tuesday webinars highlight research and novel methods uh, in various topics dealing with recycling. Some of the past webinars that we've offered in the Technology Tuesday webinar series are well today's webinar innovation and optical sorting I'm sorry that was the first webinar innovation in optical sorting technologies alternatives to disposal of gypsum wallboard waste and incorporating recycled materials into green roof media recordings of these webinars and today's webinar will be available for viewing on the RMC's YouTube channel please visit our website for more information. The Pennsylvania Recycling Market Center is proud to present this Technology Tuesday webinar series. Depending on the topic, these webinars discuss research initiatives that evaluate the use of recycled materials in new products and applications, highlight various types of equipment used to sort and or process materials that have been collected for recycling, provide an overview of how this equipment works and benefits the user with regard to production of recycled material feedstocks with less contamination and potentially higher value. When possible, invite users of the equipment or techniques to discuss how this equipment or process has helped to improve their recycling efforts. Today's webinar the Economic and Technical Analysis of Emerging Post-Consumer Plastic Recycling Methods will be presented by Dr. Uh, Matthew Franchetti, an Assistant Professor of Mechanical, Industrial, <clears throat> and Manufacturing Engineering and the Director of Undergraduate Studies of the Mechanical Industrial Engineering Programs at the University of Toledo. He is also the director of the Environmentally Conscious Design and Manufacturing Laboratory and principal investigator of the Business Waste Reduction Assistance Program, a joint effort with the Lucas County Solid Waste Management District. Dr. Franchetti received his PhD in 2003 and MBA in 2000 from the University of Toledo. He has worked as an industrial engineer and technical manager for the U.S. Postal Service in Washington, D.C., Pittsburgh, and Columbus, Ohio, and has conducted research at Daimler Chrysler, General Motors, and Ford before joining the MIME department in the fall of 2007. Dr. Franchetti is certified Six Sigma Black Belt from the American Society of Quality and has consulting and research experience with over 25 companies across the country. Matt, take it away. Thanks for the kind introduction, Jack. So it's a pleasure to be here today to present this topic. You'll notice there's a co-presenter, Connor Kress. He's actually a senior mechanical engineering student here at UT. He wasn't able to be with us here today because it's finals week at UT, so I think he's got some bigger fish to fry related to that. 
Just a brief outline of what we will discuss today. So an introduction and motivation, we'll talk about the objectives, provide some analysis and discussion, conclusions, and then lead into some future work that just happened this semester. First, in regards to motivation, a quick snapshot of the gross domestic product in the United States. You can see per capita, we've had a very steady increase in the per capita rate, right? and we can see that that's been matched with an increase in the amount of waste that we've also generated in the U.S. We've done a nice job in terms of per capita waste, and you can see that with the orange line, but in terms of total waste, we're getting this increasing trend. So more economic output, more waste are, are trends that we're seeing. One of the areas that we're looking to target is plastic. So you're seeing a snapshot now from greennature.com that lists common recycling rates for materials from 1960 to 2010. And one of the areas that we're most concerned about based on the snapshot are plastics. You can see, and this is for all plastic types. In the 90s, we were in the 3% range. And in 2010, we're in the 8% range. So this is the overall rate for all plastics. You can see that we're doing a, a decent job with paper and cardboard and metals, but, but plastics, some improvements need to be made. And there's some incentives that are really making this happen. So there's a program under President Obama called Recycling Works. And this program, again, was created under the Obama administration to promote higher recycling rates for municipal solid waste, MSW. If you click the next category, we should have some information come in. And under this Recycling Works program, it calls for a national recycling rate of 75% for all municipal solid waste. And it calls for a 30% reusability ratio in the manufacturing sector. One of the main ways that they're going to accomplish this is by subsidizing startup companies, is what the, uh, the proposal is looking at. So right now, we're beginning to see the storm of increasing recycling rates, or excuse me, increasing waste rates, increasing economic production, and now we're looking to, to reduce that waste. So this leads to the need to develop new materials for sortation. So most industrial methods require large amounts of initial capital to get started. They have longer payback periods. We have some accuracy issues with some of the emerging methods for recycling that we'll discuss. Some may require excessive labor. And most importantly, they do not have universal functionality. And what I mean by that as we get into the next few slides over the next few minutes is that most of the methods are able to sort either whole bottles or already shredded plastic pieces. So we're trying to find a method that maybe could handle both. So again, why plastics? It contributes to a large percentage of the municipal solid waste stream, 12%. The rates are low, as we saw in the previous slide, at 8%. We do have some government incentives, the recycling works. And plastic is relatively easy to recycle, and we have seen some really nice emerging methods. So it just really seems like a perfect point to begin to start as far as increasing a, a rate of a material in the U.S. So the problem statement, again, plastic rates have been remarkably low. In 2010, the U.S. generated 31 million tons of plastics. Again, we saw that 8% was recycled. And plastic recycling methods for plastic particles, so that shredded plastics are not very accurate at sorting plastics by type. And just to give you some perspective on that, we have a company located in Toledo, which is where I'm based out of, called PTI. And they make the uh, quite a few beverage bottles. So for soda pop, two liter bottles, the uh, smaller size bottles. And through their manufacturing processes, they wind up with a lot of small scraps. But they don't have an effective way to sort it. So their approach has been landfilling or maybe some less cost effective means. So we're trying to find a more effective method, do you have plastic scraps so it's already shredded into small particles, let's say less than a half inch big, is there a way that we can effectively sort these so they could be recycled? So that was really our, our problem. Can we help this company do this? And through the presentation over the next few minutes, what I'll be discussing, mainly through Connor's help, doing a survey of what are the current methods that are used in industry to sort recyclables, specifically plastics, and can we look at a new method or maybe create a new method that would be more effective? So the motivation, again, to explore the new technologies, including both whole plastic bottles or particles. And we're also looking at more efficient and accurate systems, also from a cost standpoint. So we may be able to develop a better, more accurate system. But if it is at a higher cost than the current state of technology, 
it won't be adopted. So that's uh, a heavy concern in these studies as well. So again, the research objectives were to develop a new technology to really begin to shift this paradigm, strongly focus on cost effectiveness, focus on accuracy versus the conventional method, try to get throughput rates that are equal to or greater than what the conventional methods are. So if we are proposing a, a new method, we will fully compare that to existing methods, be able to sort both whole containers or shredded plastic particles, be scalable, and obviously safety is the utmost concern for industry. And this is a review for most of the group, I'm sure, just the seven different plastic types. We have mainly focused on the uh, plastic types one, two, three, and four primarily, and the methods that we're looking at. Seven, obviously, is a problem for a lot of groups that are interested in plastic recycling. So the methods we're proposing could potentially sort all types. So this is the, the spectrum, the constraints that we're moving forward with. This is the loop for the plastic recycling process. So we start at the top with the whole container that's crushed, it's transported, it's sorted, it's shredded, melted, and then back to a raw material. What we're potentially proposing to do at the bottom of this slide, we have the shredded particles and the sorted particles in the loop. Can we reverse these two and have a more cost-effective and accurate system for plastic recycling? So instead of sorting whole containers and then shredding, can we shred everything regardless of type and then sort it in a more cost-effective way? So that was one of the, uh, the paradigms that we were looking at potentially shifting. So how are plastic re recycled? So just elaborating on the previous slide, collected, sorted, there's grinding, decolorization, and then reformed by melting. So just the general framework of the process. Next slide, please. The scenarios that we considered for the, the processes are listed on this slide, and we primarily looked at five, electrostatic, sink swim, surfacant, near-infrared scanning, and ultrasonic scanning. So we'll give a quick analysis of each of these. First, the electrostatic separation. And this is a process that does start by grinding the plastic into small fragments. And you statically charge the particles through the cyclone method that you can see in the diagram on the right. And you expose the charged particles to an electromagnetic source that will then sort the magnets into collection bins that you can see at the bottom. B1, B2, B3, and based on the plastic type, it will have a different charge and potentially fall in a different uh, bin. If we go to the next slide, it provides some additional information on this process. So the air is used to accelerate the mixture into the cyclone and to rub it against the inner lining. After a certain period of frictional charging time, the oppositely charged plastics fall freely down between the exposed electrodes and then are essentially drawn to that plate. So this is a schematic of what the process would look like, including the source where this was pulled from. The pros or positives of this method is that it can be an inexpensive industrial application. It's uh, somewhat reliable. It was actually developed in the 1990s, and it's able to sort plastic particles. Earlier I mentioned that we we're potentially looking to shift the process instead of sorting whole containers and then shredding for recycling, shred first and then sort. So by definition, if we're able to sort shredded particles, we can really handle both scenarios. So this is a scenario that can handle that. Some of the cons that are very limiting for this, it's really not novel. The accuracy of this has been a problem when, it's, when it has been used. There are scaling issues as far as upscaling it. The throughput rates are relatively low, and it can be energy intensive. So this is really a method that hasn't been heavily adopted as we're around the world. The second method is actually one of the oldest methods for sortation. It's the sink-swim differential method. And it is quite simple. Essentially, you mix plastic particles into a large container filled with a liquid of known density. And heavier plastics sink, lighter plastics float. And this is actually system is used for many automated systems as, as far as one component of that. If we go to the next slide. We have a short YouTube video that demonstrates this method. In the video that you're watching, you can see three different channels. We can see an operator that is placing the uh, plastic into the channels. It's shredded. It's different types. And the plastic then flows between the three different channels. 
each channel being filled with a different liquid with a different density that allows certain plastic types, again, based on its density of compared to the liquid to float or sink. And then the plastics can either be skimmed off the top or collected from the bottom of the unit. And this is a system, again, that uses three different tanks to be able to do that skimming process. So this is a, an example of this sink or swim differential method. If we go to our next slide, we can look at a small twist on that same method. This is similar to the differential method, but it's called the surficant aided method. And a surficant is basically a chemical coating that's applied to the plastics before it's immersed into a liquid of known density. So when using this method, the materials are separated, or excuse me, the, the materials to be separated are first treated with the surficant and then suspended typically in water. Because of the reaction with the surficant material, the plastics that would normally sink to the bottom are suspended in the li liquid. Air is then introduced into the system via pump, and the air bubbles adhere to some particles, depending on their resin type, causing the plastics to float to the surface. Materials that are not affected by the bubbles sink to the bottom. And again, it's based on the resin type. Collection systems at the top and the bottom of the system are then used to collect the separated particles. And you can see a small schematic of that on the right. And here's a short video that provides some details on that as well. Now they're giving an overview of some of the equipment that's used in it. The input material, the auger system that they use, plastic being introduced in. And we can see the process where they're introducing the plastic that's coated with the surficant, allowing some plastics to float to the top and more to sink. So again, the surficant or this, this liquid that's used to coat the plastic types then essentially enhances either the plastic floating to the top via the bubbles or sinking to the bottom to be collected. And we can see a method where they're collecting from the, uh, the bottom of the process or the skimming from the, the top in the previous picture. The draining process. Uh, we can go to the next slide. Which next leads to the most commonly used method in industry, which is infrared scanning. And it operates on the concept that plastics can be analyzed using near-infrared scans that examine Density, uh, density spectrometry and resin color. It recognizes the density by exposing the plastic sampled infrared light and then it processes the returned wavelength. It uses high speed cameras to look for resin after identifying the plastic type. It is marked optically and then the plastic is removed from the line. And typically it's done with a jet of compressed air that will just push the plastic type off. So infrared scanning will essentially identify what the piece is based on returning wavelength. That piece is identified and tracked, and then it's essentially moved off of the belt, either through air or mechanical means. If we go to the next slide, we have a, a video of this process. Or excuse me, one more slide. So the infrared scanning is uh, widely used in industry. It works for very large volumes. It uses, again, the infrared scanning system, and it's, it's very accurate. Methods have shown it to be about 98% accurate in its processes. And here's the uh, video. And again, this is a very common method. Most mature recovery facilities will use some form of infrared scanning at some point along their automated processes. You can see it moving under the belt where the material is red via infrared. <clears throat> And I apologize for the graininess of this video. This is a, a two-step process where either the plastic is a jet of air will shoot it to the top conveyor belt if it's a certain type or allow it to drop to a lower conveyor, lower conveyor belt if it's a, a different type of plastic based on the settings of the machine. All right, and then if we go to our next video, this is an emerging method that uses infrared scanning, but it uses it on the plastic particles. <clears throat> and it's actually a very interesting method that, to my understanding, is not in full production. This is a simulation of how the method would operate. So there's an infrared scanner at the top with the red beam, 
that's analyzing the past plastic types by layer as it comes through. Using high-speed computer processing, it then analyzes what type of plastic is at each level, essentially creating a 3D graphic, a topography of the different plastic types. So now the machine knows at each layer as it's dropping which plastic type is at each layer at each position. And then as that layer continues to move down the conveyor belt, there are air jets that are linked to that topography and it's sending very specific directed air jets to very specific points to air blast the plastic particles into different separation bins. So that is an emerging method that right now isn't on the market, but could potentially use the existing technology of infrared scanning to sort the plastic types. And on to our next slide. We look at some of the pros and cons, and this is primarily focusing on the existing technology for near-infrared scanning. It's somewhat inexpensive compared to the newer applications that may require heavy R&D expenditure. Its accuracy is one of the highest of the conventional methods. It is the industry leader in terms of methods. Again, it's a relatively older technology. It's most widely used. It's difficulty, it can have some difficulty in sorting colored plastics. And the method, we did show the simulation of the new method. It's not able to sort plastic particles at this point. So if the plastic has already been shredded, it can have difficulty with that. There's also a method that uses ultrasonic waves that works very similar to the infrared scanning, but the plastic in this stage is typically, again, ground into small bits, roughly 20 millimeters. They are then submerged into water that is roughly 100 millimeters deep. Then the plastics are scanned using multiple ultrasonic waves at various wavelengths. This produces an accurate image of the plastics and then using mechanical means, the plastic is removed from the line. So very similar to the simulation method that we saw, the plastic is submerged. Ultrasonic waves are then taken of the profile that moves through, and then some type of mechanical means is used to separate it. So this would be considered an emerging means for plastic particles as well. Just an analysis of the, the three scenarios, and Connor was a, a contributor on this. We looked at some of the plastic waste that was generated here in Lucas County through drop-off collection bins that are uh, commingled, so they would contain both whole plastic bottles and metal cans. They uh, separate the plastic bottles out, and just looking at that stream, how much would it cost the city of Toledo to adopt one of these systems in order to be able to sort it? So pulling some information together from vendors, we looked at the equipment cost and installation, the processing capacity, based on that, and then the accuracy ratings. And scenario four is near-infrared scanning. And as you can see, based on what we analyzed on the market, it would be the uh, one of the lowest cost methods, generate some of the highest accuracy, and have some of the highest throughput. And it's just really a tested and true technology. So if the city of Toledo were to move forward with one of these options, it appears the infrared scanning would, would make the most sense at that point. But it still doesn't answer the question of how do we handle plastic particles, the company that I mentioned earlier uh, couldn't solve this. So moving on to the, the next slide provides again the analysis that I talked about, the comparison, the efficiency rating. So again, number four is, is a fast, fast method, most effective. If we move on to the next slide, the cost options again, scenario four, the infrared scanning, one of the lower options. Five is still uh, needs a little more investigation. The next slide. So in conclusion, four appears to be the best widely accepted low capital investment compared to the other places. But again, it doesn't address the plastic particle issue. So if we go on to the next slide, we really want to dig a little bit deeper. So in terms of just the plastic particle methods for separation, we looked at the ultrasonic method, and we looked at the near-infrared scanning method or the differential swing sink swim method. <clears throat> they all have their advantages and disadvantages. We, as a uh, research team, tried to develop a, a new method. Is there maybe some new emerging technology that could do what we'd like with plastic particles at a higher throughput rate, at a lower cost, and at a higher accuracy? And one area that actually Connor, one of the authors that I introduced uh, in the beginning, 
this was an idea that he initially began to uh, move forward with. He had a heavy interest in ferrofluid and magnetic processes, so we really began to explore this. And I'll actually talk a little bit more about this over the next few slides. So if we go to the next slide, we're looking at a way that we can use the, the process to handle this. And I'll describe the drawings over the next few slides in a little more detail. If we move on to the next slide. So again, looking for a new technology that can be just as accurate just as cost effective, able to sort particles. Some problems that we're looking at though with this method, there's no history of it as an industrial application for plastic sortation, and there's really not a proof of concept. So our goal was to develop a proof of concept for this ferrofluid sorting method. So if we go to our next slide. <clears throat> we performed a house of quality. So first we said really should we move forward with the ferrofluid electromagnetic sortation process. And I'll provide some details on exactly what that is over the next couple slides. But first, we compare that to the existing methods as far as looking for something that's new that can sort plastic particles. So we applied what's called a house of quality. And it's essentially a process where we try to translate customer requirements, which would be shown in the leftmost column, with the engineering tools or methods that we could use to solve those problems. And then we essentially use a weighted matrix to give each of the different systems, so design one, design four, design six, a value, sum the values, and whatever row at the very bottom has the highest value indicates that that's overall going to best meet the needs of the client. So in this case, we're looking at the client as ourselves, which of these processes would, would best relate. So in this case, it, look, it looks like the electromagnetic ferrofluid fluid method was worthwhile to move forward with, so it's the method we decided to go a little bit deeper with. So we decided not to look at electrostatic. We decided not to look at near-infrared scanning for particles, but let's focus on this EM ferrofluid method. So again, best potential for emerging technologies. We'll meet research objectives, and we feel that it could be very cost effective. So the future research then would be creating this proof of concept and testing various configurations. So we'll be using an electromagnet. I'll actually show you that in the next few minutes where we can vary the frequency and the voltage that's applied through that. And then also looking at the scale up potential for it and creating a full life cycle cost analysis to understand how does this compare to the existing method. Looking at this new method, we will take a look at the method. I'll give you some more details on exactly what ferrofluid is, talk about some of the mathematics. We did create a tabletop proof of concept setup system for this that I'll show you in the next method in the next few minutes, excuse me, and then talk about the results as well. So what you're looking at in the picture on the right is, is ferrofluid. And ferrofluid is essentially a oil-based substance that has very small, either micron or nano-sized iron particles suspended in it. So when you subject this fluid to a magnetic wave, it will respond to this magnetic wave as though it's a fluid. So what you're looking at in the picture is a ferrofluid that has been excited by either a magnet or an electromagnetic wave. And it's propagating in the middle and it creates these, uh, these spikes. So what was needed, we, our plan was to start small scale, emphasize accuracy, create a system that can apply to all plastic types, would be a relatively low capital input, easy to use, and is safe. And we felt that this fluid looks like it could provide benefits in all six areas. So again, I did mention what the ferrofluid is. This, again, is ferrofluid that's responding to a magnetic wave. Typical applications in industry for this, many um, audio companies will use ferrofluid in speakers. Some automobiles will use it for differential steering systems. This would be a new application of this ferrofluid, though. And again, it's Think of it as an oil with very small iron particles suspended evenly throughout it. The ferrofluid that we looked at specifically had micron-sized particles suspended in a carrier fluid. You could see what it was composed of, 5% magnite, 10% surficant, and the 85% carrier fluid. You can see some of the details on the rough density. And this is a slide that really relays some of the physical phenomena that's happening when the ferrofluid 
is subjected to an elect electromagnetic wave. And what essentially happens, the picture on the left, you'll have the particles that are essentially freely floating within the fluid. When it is excited or subjected to a magnetic wave, the particles essentially begin to, to line up, and that's what you see on the right. And what we noticed through initial studies and several research studies is the equivalency of this is almost a density change within the liquid, liquid based on the strength of the magnetic field that the fluid is subjected to. So essentially it creates a way to change what really translates into a change in density of the liquid. And again, how this relates to recycling method is instead of using the surficant method or the differential method, with different channels of liquid, could we just have one liquid and vary the density of that single liquid and skim plastic types off the top or collect them from the bottom in some means? So this is how we're looking at applying the Sparrow method. We created a test setup for this. So we had an 8 liter pressure vessel, vessel and alternating power supply. We did create an electromagnet that had an air core, so it was a coreless electromagnet, which is also known as a solenoid test equipment, and again, our ferro-based fluid that we used. Several acquisition systems were used, so obviously we were concerned about the magnetic waves. We used Gauss sensors. We also collected thermal data using thermal couples and pressure data using pressure transducers. We used uh, national instruments, equipment, and um, linking it directly to a computer using LabVIEW to collect the data. If we go to the next slide, we can see the design for the electromagnet, so the solenoid design. So essentially it's just a wire of a certain diameter that is wound around a core, and then we essentially remove the core. We have a solenoid that we can apply a voltage to and essentially create a magnetic wave. Here is a picture of the lab setup. You'll notice on, so first I guess looking at the clear acrylic box in the middle, you'll notice there's a black liquid that's approximately halfway filled. That's the ferrofluid inside of the pressure vessel. On the left side, the kind of orangish reddish coil on the left side of the box, that is the electromagnet. And you can see various sensors that we have attached to the setup. So on the right side, we have a pressure transducer that is on the lower half of the box that can relay pressure changes within the fluid. On top of the box, there's a small clear hose that's coming out that will give us the pressure change within the air. We have several thermocouples set up as well. And you can see blue boxes that can also measure magnetic waves as they move through. So this was our, our lab set up. If we move on to the next slide, we first, before actually seeing if we really can get this pressure change to be able to do the sortation. We first had to confirm that we do indeed have a pressure vessel. So we essentially pressurized the vessel to 18 PSI and allowed it to essentially sit for a period of 400 seconds in this case to, to see what type of pressure loss we received. And overall it was very minimal as you can see from the graph. We have atmospheric pressure on the bottom the level was pressurized to. So we were content with these results, that we can move forward with this to understand if we, we do have a pressure change within this vessel. Now here are our actual test results. So what you're looking at on the left side of this graph is the case when the electromagnet is turned on. So the electromagnet is on, and the pressure change that you're looking at what we could get an accurate reading of was a pressure change within the air cabin of the pic picture. So if you remember the picture that we looked at of the test setup, we had ferro fluid in the bottom, approximately half filled, and on the top we had air. This is measuring the pressure change in the air. So when the electromagnet was turned on with a voltage of 5.4 volts, you're actually looking at two trials. Trial one is in blue, trial two is in red we did see a pressure change in the air. We had a lower pressure change. So we went from 14.5 PSI when the EM coil was not engaged in the air to about 14 on average when the EM coil was engaged. If we go to the next slide, <coughs> excuse me, we repeated this at 10.3 volts, trial one in green, trial two in purple, 
And we can see that we're approximately at the same PSI when the EM magnet is not turned on. Again, that's on the second half of this graph. And when we look at the first portion of this graph, we can see that we actually have a little more interference. So the line's a little more spread out. We're getting more variability. But if we look at our trend line, it's actually a little bit lower than the pressure from the first test. If we go to the next slide, we conducted the same experiment at 14.4 volts, trial one and trial two. Again, the left half of the graph is when the EM coil is engaged, so it's charged. The right half is when it's off. We can see that we even have a lower trend line, but again, more variance. So we are getting a change in the air pressure. We also measure temperature changes to ensure that we weren't running into any uh, major safety issues if things were becoming too hot to create a safety issue throughout. So you can see the uh, various starting temperatures, ending temperatures. And one thing I want to point out in this graph and previous graphs, so the left half of this graph is when the EM coil was engaged. The right half is when it was, was turned off. And what we're seeing, you'll notice that when it's engaged, we have this really wide band that indicates a high level variability. And when the EM coil is turned off, which are the right side of this graph, it's very thin and stable. We did get some interference from the electrical sensing equipment when the EM coil was turned on. And so again, we're getting these very widespread bands to begin with. But if we look at our trend lines, we'll see that there was a uh, change. We also were concerned about this interference piece. So in the studies over the previous slides that I had shown you, we had ferrofluid in the tank and we were getting the pressure change in the air. We filled the pressure vessel with water. So plain water conducted the same test and we did not get a change in pressure in the air with it to confirm that these results were accurate. An overlay of all the pressure changes at the, the different volts. So you could see the higher the voltage, we're getting a bigger spread, but we're also getting a higher pressure differential in the air. So if we go to our next slide, we can now see what percent change did we see at the, uh, the different levels. And we were able to get a maximum change in the lower right corner of about a 3% density change at 14.4 volts. Comparing that to 5.4 volts, we had about a 1.6% density change. So again, looking at that right column, just summarizing the results. And again, we had to back into the results as far as the pressure change within the liquid we looked at the pressure change within the air above the ferrofluid as we uh, could collect that readily and easily through the pressure transducer that we had. We we're actually getting quite a bit of interference with the pressure transducer that was in the ferrofluid liquid. So we had to use the pressure transducer that was in the air pocket above the ferrofluid in the pressure vessel. And again, we were about able to change the density, so to speak, by about 3%. Given pressure drop shown earlier, we were able to conclude that the density uh, reorganizes quickly, so essentially a lowering of the density, that um, this alternating single could be altered to produce a liquid capable of sorting shredded plastic. So again, if we could use this system now to actually sort plastics, subject, so we have the, a vessel filled, and it necessarily doesn't have to be a pressure vessel. We actually proved that recently put plastic particles in it of different types, subject it to electromagnetic wave, we can change the density to have plastic types float or sink as they move through. Next we'll go to the uh, question and answer period. All right, here's a question. Uh, how is the ferrofluid removed from the plastic once separated? Yeah, that's a good question. I think I may have been cut off right when I was beginning to describe that. And that's the next phase that we're looking at. And right now we're proposing two different methods. One method would be via air jets. And the second method that we're leaning towards is more of a centrifuge. So think of like a washing machine that would spin at a high rate that would essentially allow the ferrofluid to go to the outer chamber. There would be a screen that would pull the plastic and then the, uh, the plastic could be pulled out. So right now that's the approach that, that we're moving towards in terms of that separation piece. Okay, good. The next question, can you provide us with your contact information? 
Matthew, M-A-T-T-H-E-W, dot Franchetti, F-R-A, and is a Nancy, C-H-E-T-T-I, at U Toledo, which is all one word, U-T-O-L-E-D-O, dot E-D-U. Okay, thank you, Matt. <clears throat> the next question, are there regulations as to disposal of used ferro fluid? And right now, and to answer the question, yes, so is it treated as a hazardous waste? And right now it's in the category of an industrial type of waste that would be on the order of a oil that would say be used in an industrial automotive application and also a, a metal processing application. So, so yes, there are some concerns about that. One of the issues though that we're seeing with ferrofluid is though that it, it hasn't been really regulated yet because it is a relatively new product and it's being used in, in new ways. So as far as like the regulation piece, it, it's not probably up to the, the level that it needs to be. Probably the, the same as nanomaterials that we're beginning to see more regulations from an environmental standpoint related to disposal and care of nanomaterials. And we're beginning to see the same with ferrofluids. Uh, Matt, is, is the ferrofluid like a, uh, for example, a motor oil? Yes, it, if you were to, if same consistency, very same look. The fluid that we used, the ferrofluid that we used for the study that was shown in the presentation was an oil-based ferrofluid. So it's very thick, very similar to a motor oil consistency. For a new study that we just conducted, there's a new material. It's actually a water-based ferrofluid. It's still a very dark color. It's not as black as the ferrofluid that, that we uh, saw in the pictures today, but it's still a very dark color, almost opaque, but it's not as viscous as the oil-based ferrofluid. Okay. So I, I guess from your description, the ferrofluid is is kind of like uh, our used motor oil. It, yeah, it's yeah. oil with uh, bits of uh, metal in it. Steel. Right. It's probably the consistency would be more similar to uh, clean motor oil that hasn't been run through an engine. Mm -hmm. The used oil can become very viscous and very thick. It's more along the lines of like a um, cooking oil type of consistency. Yeah, and with with the ferrofluid, do you see uh, limits as to the types of plastic that can be potentially prom uh, processed with this method? We were able to sort plastic types one through four. We're still looking at the other types. At, at this point, we we don't see a limitation to it, and we're going to further investigate. Um, the, right now, the constraint is the density of the ferrofluid, which is variable. You could have a different uh, carrier for it, so a different oil with a different density. And then how can we essentially change the density? And I, I say change density. We're actually creating a buoyancy force that's allowing us to allow the plastic types to float to the top. But the effect is it, it almost looks and feels like a, a density change. But what that's based on is the voltage that we put through the electromagnet. So that's a, a constraint for the system would be the voltage and then altering the frequency of it uh, plus the initial density of whatever fluid it's in. So as long as we can work with within the two constraints plus the density, the specific density of any plastic that we put into it, types one, two, three, four, or so forth, we can get the same sortation effect. Okay. <clears throat> The next question is, we will have to have a wash system to remove the oil con contamination on the plastics. And I guess that's a question for you. Well, and that's right now. So yeah, and that's an excellent point. And that's what we're looking at now with the next phase. Now, how cost effectively can we go through a cleaning process for that? And it's not anything that's unusual. So the surficant method that I gave a, a brief summary of earlier, they had to go through a cleaning process as well to remove the surficant from the plastics. And again, like a centrifuge 
air jets can be used, introducing it to another chemical, another liquid bath that could remove it. So there are several different ways that we'd have to move to. But that's a, a perfect line of thought that we should be looking at for this method to determine if it is cost effective. One of the big benefits of the infrared scanning method is there is not a cleanup for it. Once the plastic sorted, it's ready for shredding. The next stage is this. There would be an intermediary step. So the entire process would have to be compared to the existing methods to see what, what is or maybe is not cost effective. Okay, next question. What is the cost of ferrofluid and is it readily available? And Yeah, good question. And it, it depends. So a liter, so we purchased a liter for around $30. And you can find them through quite a few marketers, either local or actually if you do an internet search, you can find quite a bit of it. It's actually not that complicated to, to make that many universities, including our own here at UT, are able to make it in-house at a relatively low cost. So I, I guess to answer the question specifically, if you buy it off the market, it's between $30 to $50 a liter. So it is somewhat costly if you, you buy it directly from the market. But if you have your own in-house means to make it, it um, not uh, incredibly expensive. And of course, if this technology begins to take off, then uh, there will be uh, probably more sources of ferrofluid available to choose from. Right. Okay, next question. How clean does the plastic need to be to be sorted by this method, and does this help with post cleaning of the plastics? Yeah, that's actually a really good question. At this point, we used plastic bottles that, that had been used and placed in a recycling container. Container, We, we didn't apply any uh, cleaning to it, so we didn't clean out the, the insides of the bottle. Uh, we just sorted the plastic pieces and, and placed them in. That, that's something I think we need to investigate a little bit further, depending on the contamination that is on the plastics. All right, next question. How effective is density for separating polymers, especially foamed and filled polymer products? Yeah, that's one that could be a little tricky for this method, especially if we're looking at, let's say, a foam plastic that has air pockets within it. That, that could pose some challenges. One way that we could alleviate that, and one thing that's been effective with this method, is uh, changing the size of the particle. So if we could grind it into even smaller pieces before moving on to kind of eliminate that. Because obviously the, the air pockets and the, the foam would cause the plastic to float to the top that may not be at the, let's say, specific gravity for that specific plastic type. So, so that would be a concern. I, we'd have to investigate further guess doing a finer grind on the, the plastic types before we send them into the process. Okay. Well, thank you, Matt. Uh, I believe that's the end of the questions uh, for today. I'd like to remind the audience that uh, Matt's presentation will be available on the uh, RMC website and uh, Matt gave his email address um, earlier and perhaps we could uh, uh, just repeat that here in a minute in case somebody else wants to contact Matt uh, uh, right away. So without any more questions appearing, uh, Matt, are there any final comments you'd like to make? I'd just like to thank everyone for their attention and if, yeah, if I can be of any help or any collaboration, feel free to contact me. Okay, and give your uh, email address one more time, Matt. Sure, it's uh, Matthew, M-A-T-T-H-E-W, dot Franchetti, F-R-A-N-C-H-E-T-T-I, at utoledo, U-T-O-L-E-D-O, -E dot E-D-U. Okay, well thank you Matt for a, a very interesting summary of existing plastic sortation methods and a look into the potential future of where this uh, technology may end up and I'm sure you'll 
you'll get some follow-up from our attendees today. So this is Jack Himes thanking the audience for attending and submitting some very good questions and thanks again to Matt for an outstanding presentation today. Goodbye.